really pertain directly to the women and that's not what the data show what the data showed is that the women are indirectly benefiting from uh, from ODA yeah. and that's a significant marker yes. so I learned new things today I thank you and what I would like to say is that okay since we know that gender equity yields positive development outcomes then question is why would donors not choose to design ODA to become um, uh, design ODA to benefit directly the women so it's really a shift from significant marker to principal marker and I think that's an important point that uh, the paper produced and and uh, my last comment is that this will be an important information given to policymakers, especially in your countries, which, as data would show, have uh, made significant contributions to ODA. Let me now go to Professor Ishikawa, a Japanese role for ASEAN's development. This is what happened. I read your paper first, so I have many comments. <laughs> 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 and the, and the, Last two papers, only a few comments because I was very tired. I'm 68 years, <laughs> 68 years old, so you should forgive me. But anyway, uh, the paper offers an interesting interpretation of the role of Japanese policies and its accompanying state-driven ODA in ASEAN development. And you summarize very well the different viewpoints on the role of Japan in ASEAN development because there is a conversation that uh, it's not really just a unidirectional uh, thing in terms of benefits. You're talking about mutual benefit coming from uh, mutual benefit of both recipient and, and donor country. So I was tempted to say, maybe you would want to retitle your paper as Japanese and ASEAN in mutual development. Japanese and ASEAN role in mutual development instead of just Japanese role for ASEAN's development because what the paper shows is that um, the aid that you gave to recipient countries were really also self-interest because of self-interest and that's a fact and uh, if you talk of the US, if you talk of EU, it's the same thing so my flippant remark is why don't you change the title of your paper to Japanese and ASEAN role in mutual development but that's a flippant remark what I would say is an important part of our paper is the insight that ASEAN integration is the key to further development in this part of the globe, and that this is good not only for the ASEAN member states, but also for the stability and prosperity of Japan as an integrated ASEAN becomes a hub of regional cooperation. So, a richer ASEAN is good for Japan, as well as this rich Japan, stable Japan is good for ASEAN. So the mutuality is obvious. <coughs> it's good to have a clear explanation of the relationship between the two parties. It recognizes the truth that in the case of official development assistance, whether this comes from Japan or another developed country, it is offered not without strings attached, but first and foremost, it's driven by the self-interest of the giving state. Because export markets should continue to be accessible to them, and instability arising from poverty, inequality, or social strife in the recipient states should be addressed, lest the giving state suffers from negative spillover effects. We think of the immigration in Europe, uh, the poor countries in Africa, Horn of Africa, in elsewhere, are sending a stream of migrants to, to, to Europe. And the uh, strategy is stop them, not at the borders, but stop them right in their own countries. And the way to do that is to provide assistance to this country so that you know economic activity will be stimulated in, in their respective countries and that put a stop to this uh, a migration stream. That seems to be um, a, a part of the conversation right now uh, in the international community. The professor said that Japanese economic cooperation, particularly its ODA, should employ a more pro-poor approach with deliberate efforts to tackle inequality and disparities. And this is one of your excellent suggestions. That uh, uh, what you're saying is maybe we should try to tweak a bit the ODA policy and pay more attention to designing them tilted towards uh, addressing poverty inequality and inequality in the ASEAN. 
Your second suggestion fits well with the ASEAN member states' development strategies, and that is to attract and utilize FDI for future growth. Her sensible advice is that each ASEAN member state should work out its own development paradigm, but with an eye for institutions employed by Japan for its own post-war development efforts. You, she was saying you cannot really replicate the, the Japanese development experience, but there are institutions that have been developed throughout this development experience which may serve well the interests of the developing countries, namely public-private partnership, because you use this in your own uh, uh, development drive, the important role of the government in the market, notwithstanding the debate, is it state and markets? It's not really state versus markets, but the state with the market addressing particular issues and linking domestic, regional, and international markets. Third, Japanese ODA will not be ODA if it doesn't have a centerpiece infrastructural development. That's where you're good at. Again, a good insight from her is that the competitive environment for infrastructural development brought about by the entry of China may provide better opportunities because it fosters greater bargaining power in the recipient states. Because China is there as a disruptor. So now the ADB, Japan, the United States are rethinking the, how they would extend foreign aid and influence also the recipient states. Competition is good. Fourth, Japan's own experience and expertise in disaster management serves well the economic cooperation with the ASEAN. ASEAN member states should take advantage of this outstanding resource in the region because of your experience, the expertise is in Japan. In the final analysis, Japanese investments, ODA, and economic cooperation hinges on supporting and strengthening the liberal order, which has not gone unchallenged in recent years. She knows well, the professor knows well, that it's continuing, Japan's continuing prosperity draws from maintaining a liberal world order. It is safe to assume that the ASEAN member states are aware of this and that the future of an integrated ASEAN, which in the professor's mind is the key to further development, rests on the same liberal and market-oriented world order that has, that has served Japan well and many emerging economies as well. That ends my comments on the professor. And number three, July. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Uh, professor Wang Meibu. Okay. <coughs> I learned also new things here. Thank you. <laughs> the paper gives very interesting insights on why China is pouring billions upon billions of dollars of infrastructure investments in countries strung along the Belt and Road. Yeah, it's good to have uh, how many trillion dollars in international reserves you have. You can <laughs> finance this kind of thing. So China's very rich. Those insights may lead to a better understanding of this massive investment program, which dwarfs any that the world has ever seen. The nearest uh, example could be what, uh, Marshall Plan? implemented and funded by the U.S. to rebuild Western Europe from the ashes of the Second World War. However, the Marshall Plan will pale in comparison to the BRI initiative if the latter is fully implemented. Once everything's been laid out, Marshall Plan will just be what? An insignificant, uh, maybe, uh, intervention compared to this massive BRI, if fully implemented. Professor Wang identifies several areas that have to be addressed in order for the BRI to bear fully the envisaged fruits of growth and greater trade and investment ties in the BRI countries with China as the main driver of growth. So in, in your world vision, China is the main driver of growth and the BRI countries would be there and would, they would have mutual trade and investment ties which will propel growth in those countries as well as in China. She mentioned the big gap between fund and supply. These are the things that she said her government should address. And balance aid sector distribution, maybe should give more for equity, uh, gender equity and development. <laughs> <laughs> <Correlated>. <laughs> Low concessional level, less attention to environmental and social effects, 
lack of monitoring and evaluation <coughs> system, and advises that China should reform its AIDS policy and management. It's becoming obvious these days that the entry of China in the foreign aid community as a major provider of concessional loans, grants, and technical assistance has stimulated a strong response from the US and Japan, which have traditionally been the largest aid provider in East, and Asia, East Asia and the ASEAN. As I said, China was a is a disruptor. The competition among these major lenders is welcome to the ASEAN because it offers an opportunity to access finance at the least possible, at the least cost possible, maybe without having to worry about loan conditionalities. <laughs> we have a lender that imposes certain loan conditionalities, and we know who these are, and this include the multilaterals. And then there's another kid in town, game in town, saying, I can give you a loan, concessional at that, and then I don't impose anything or any conditions at all. No. So it will depend on, on the recipient country which one to choose. <coughs> As they say, in the matter of dispute, in the matter of taste, there's no, dis there's no dispute. A point that I would like to make in this conversation, okay, because we're saying hey, BRI is useful, helpful, but that is something that has to be shown empirically at some point down the road. We will have the numbers down the road, and we will probably, researchers would be able to assess whether indeed the BRI achieved its uh, objectives. But that's, that's for the future conference of the CAIDEC. I hope to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, Julius my, was my student in graduate school. <laughs> he was telling me to shut up. <laughs> 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 too much talk, he said. No, too much talk, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Can you, what's the point? So, so let me jump to the conclusion. Um, I, I can give you a copy of my comments if, if you want. Now, let me see. See, you distracted me, so let me see. <laughs> let me. <laughs> okay, the BRI investments are tremendous opportunities for Chinese private business and state owned firms to generate outputs and employment for the benefit of the Chinese economy. Now, this is not unique to China because other donors have similarly tied their foreign aid to private trade, commerce, and investments. So, there's not, uh, not something to be. Uh, shame about that this is just the way it is. Bilateral aid is expectedly tied aid. And it's not necessarily bad. It could be bad, not necessarily bad. Its outcome depends on how the lender and lender countries and recipient countries play their cards on the bargaining table. So it needs some maturity, especially in the part of the recipient countries. You just don't get a loan because it's concessional. You get it because it will address really effectively the development constraints. Now, five minutes, Julius. I'm old, old man, eh? so old man can impose on young man. <laughs> Three, four? Four. Two more to go. Okay, I'll speak rapidly so that this uh, Professor Sania's paper really touched an important issue and gave good advice to establish ARF on security as a permanent body to make politically binding recommendations and binding decisions. Oh, I hope this will really happen, but it's difficult. This is most welcome, but it may take time to achieve this. It's a good insight because he said, let's stop having a talking club. Let's have something that will bind us to certain decisions made by the body. Now, it will depend a lot, okay? Many things. Political security is an important pillar of the ASEAN economic community, and everybody agrees to that it, it is a necessary, uh, it's a good that we must aspire for, public good. But how to do it, that's the problem. So uh, right now, the ARF is not permanent. It has no binding decisions. Recommendations are taken as recommendations, and countries can as well uh, proceed with their own desire or wishes, notwithstanding ARF discussion. Because the issue is, when you want to have a permanent ARF, then that would require a surrender of a, some degree of sovereignty. ASEAN is not ready for this. It has done well in the economic side of, of the picture, in establishing, in establishing the community, <coughs> but on the political side, 
um, that's something to be uh, wished for. But thank you for flagging that. That's an important issue. And finally, on Professor Jin Yong Lee's excellent paper, I'd like to congratulate the author for providing a providing a frank and honest assessment of the motivation behind South Korea's international development relationship with the ASEAN. You're saying in the past it's really motivated by having allies to maintain security and stability in the peninsula, using the ASEAN as a leverage for that thing to happen, which is not a bad thing because everybody uh, stands to benefit from a secure and stable peninsula. and. Of course, uh, the undercurrent here is that trade cannot go on if there is that instability and insecurity. Let me jump to because I have talking out time. The author points out that although Korea's ASEAN policy is weak, development cooperation is seeking qualitative and quantitative growth in a wide variety of areas. And that's a very good point. Recognizing that maybe it's weak, in the sense of re really uh, using the foreign aid to have deeper economic ties with, with ASEAN and not just for political uh, reasons. However, the new Southern policy could be a window, I say window, that will lead to, to intensified international development cooperation with ASEAN that goes beyond using South Korea's ties with the ASEAN to bolster its security in the peninsula. This is a very good sign because both South Korea and the ASEAN stand to gain from stronger cooperation predicated on expanding markets for either partners through closer trade and business relationships. As the paper of Professor Nishikawa has showed earlier, there is scope for mutual development between partners through <coughs> foreign aid, trade and investments. And I would say, notwithstanding what the leaders are doing or not doing, the markets, private business, they vote with their feet. So notwithstanding what you said here, you know, our foreign aid is orientated towards security in North Korea, Korean businessmen are here making investments. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lianto. <laughs> Next time I won't chair where my pro former professor is. It's difficult to control your <laughs> former professors. <laughs> yes. May I now invite Dr. Bim Prasad Shastra to give his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, this topic is about uh, the non-Asian actors for Russians' development. So um, just now we have heard the comments by Dr. Gilberto regarding he is an ASEAN member and he has seen the, the non asean actors playing in ASEAN's development. That is probably the comments was driven on that line. But since I'm from Nepal, I'm a non asean member. I'll try to see, I'll try to complement what you have said because as a non asean member and non asians how non asians are doing to the development of ASEAN sectors. Because I represent the country like uh, Nepal where we have a SARC, South Asian Regional Corporation. That is, uh, I think I'm only representing from there where India, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, Afghanistan also these days are there. And uh, yeah, as a member. And plus two is a China and, and other countries. China is also now participating in SARC. That is one. Another is uh, BIMSTEC, that is uh, Bay of Bengal. Um, uh, this is um, another trade groups that is being formed with uh, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand. We are uh, in the group. So I will try to see from those perspective how uh, these five papers that have been presented is uh, related to non-ASEAN actors playing in ASEAN development. Uh, so as individual paper, I have uh, I have uh, very keenly. Uh, I mean, was to your presentations. Uh, the number one presentations about the ODA in a gender equality by Japan and Korea. It seems to be very, to be very frank and honest with the uh, Professor Im from the Iwa Women's University. This is a very traditional kind of a scenario where Japan and Korea try to compete each other's uh, for her. Uh, for always, you know, I, I, I basically I studied in Japan. I spent almost six years in Japan and 
then back to Nepal and started working with the Korean, Korean uh, support, Korean government support agencies. So I always see, you know, whenever there is a Japan and Korea is playing Olympic, they don't say which position is Japan or which Korea position is Korea. Then how many difference number difference between Korea and Japan? So this is a kind of a competitive mindset that is well uh, reflected in her presentation. Yes, but one thing very interesting part that you have shown <coughs> is uh, uh, the, the, the Japan's contribution for gender equality in ODA is uh, next to EU, you said, right? So, but, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, the significant amount is in, is in critical issues by Japan. Uh, women's are not directly benefited by Japanese corporations. However, the Korean projects are, numbers are less, but they are directly benefiting the women's. So, but this analysis gives us a kind of a conceptualization or, or, or coming to a conclusion that uh, the countries where the women and men are not very much define, definable in, in a way like uh, when we are talking about uh, malnutrition or poverty or something like, uh, you know, there we don't think too much about whether it's a women malnutrition or male malnutrition. We don't say whether it's a poverty eradication for male poverty eradication or female poverty eradication because the countries like uh, in, in a still in India or Pakistan or, or, or some part in the, 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 the gender issues becomes again a secondary priority rather than how to give the mortality rate for uh, children is more important. Whether it's a male child or a female child, it, is, it, 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 is, it becomes irrelevant sometimes. So that perspective also, being a non-ASEAN member, uh, I think if you see that part, it, you, could, you could make your paper more holistic uh, and can be implied anywhere in the world. Because to be very frank, you know, because these things become uh, materialized only when you have a little bit of, uh, because ASEAN countries are in, in Asia itself, in Asia and in whole Asia coming from Central Asia, Kazakhstan or other parts uh, coming to India and Nepal, uh, Bangladesh and others. Uh, the South Asian, ASEAN countries way above uh, the average uh, support they require when we talk about foreign aids. So in that case, uh, I think giving the blanket support for uh, gender equality or quality uh, for both male or female is equally important. And what Japan has been doing, I think probably this is what in line with. Uh, second, I'm just going fast because I'm just trying to see, because most of thing has been covered by Gilbert, so I'm just trying to complement what has not been covered, okay? So the second part about Ikiko uh, Nishikawa, her model of uh, Partnership. It is the Japan's role in, uh, in, in developing uh, foreign, providing foreign aid for ASEAN countries, not simply as a, say, foreign aid, like a, uh, giving someone is giving and someone is receiving. Rather, they need a supporter. They need a partners to grow in these regions because Japan alone cannot work. Uh, it reminded me one, one of the because recently I was attending one of another conference, I mean, where, where donors were meeting. Like, uh, most of the countries where I particularly represent uh, Nepal, the, our surrounding countries are influenced, not under the influence of Japan before the Second World War. Because if you see the ASEAN countries, talking about the Philippines, talking about, uh, say, even Korea, I mean, China was under the strong influence of Japanese, uh, that kind of, uh, that before World War II. And, and in that time, you know, in our part, when we talk about India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they were under the strong influence of British rule, okay? So more or less around the same time, you know, the British also, uh, I mean, liberated Indian subcontinent, and Japan also has to uh, liberate, uh, I, mean, I don't say liberate, but kind of, uh, you know, they have to disassociate with uh, this kind of engagement, engagement with the, in this part of the, in this part of the ASEAN. So if you s compare the development speed, then I was asked, I, I asked those two persons, one standing from me, UK, DFID, loan sector, DFID, and another from the Japanese side. Then I asked, see, the UK has gone back to 
England, and this part remains still poor. India, Pakistan still remain poor. But Japan disengaged from ASEAN countries after the Second World War, and this region has developed very fast. What could be the reason? Then the answer was very interesting. Of course, this, it was it was answer was very interesting in a sense that when the UK was ruling those parts, they they was just thinking like a ruling those countries, and the UK is already developed. They don't need that part, India and Pakistan, to further develop their industrialization. Whereas when Japan was getting engaged, associated, I don't say the similar kind of a role as UK and India, but uh, some kind of a similar engagement between you, uh, Japan and ASEAN countries, when Japan got I mean, lifted out from this region, these countries were also developing. The Japan was developing industrial sectors here. So, for example, in Thailand, I was there. A lot of, uh, lot of uh, auto industries in Thailand is from Japanese. Toyota is being manufactured in Thailand. So, when, when the influence in these regions, Japan got liberated from that that part. These regions also got industrially developed. Meaning, the Japan's association with ASEAN was kind of uh, developing industries. The main industries was being developed there, and parts were getting. Developed there. So industrialization was taking place. Of course, it has a both positive and negative sides because the way they use the resources and others, they have positive. But only I'm saying after the deassociation from the region, from the UK and Japan, how the region got developed. So that was just a quick answer. And this this was a really um, uh, Dr. Yukiko's Nishikawa's papers was like a kind of, uh, you know, Japan is associated with ASEAN, is not because ASEAN needs Japan all the time, but Japan also needs ASEAN, so they develop industrial setup, industrial backup, industrial training works, and that got, eventually got boosted, even after uh, the Japan is disassociated from these regions. So that's a good part, so as, as you see from the non-ASEAN member, okay. And Third one about uh, Dr. Meibu Huang, China, about Belt and Road Initiative and Chinese foreign aid. I'm very much concerned as a non-ASEAN also, because Nepal is a one of the signatory in Belt and Road Initiative uh, among the SARC countries. India is still to sign this Belt and Road Initiative. India is not a signatory. Nepal and Pakistan, we sign the agreement to be a part of Belt and Road Initiative. And this, this is bringing heavy investment bringing connecting the road, railway network from Kathmandu to Beijing so this is this is Kathmandu Shanghai we are getting connected through railway network so that will really would revolutionize the kind of a uh, development pace that we have been seeing and as a ASEAN connectivity this will again get connected with ASEAN through our partners in Myanmar and Thailand because we are connected through BIMSTEC BIMSTEC is uh, BIMSTEC is a regional network uh, recently, we organized the BIMSEL uh, Central Office in Kathmandu. So, this having a railway connectivity from already the railway has reached to Shigatse in China. Uh, we are very near to near to reaching the railway is near to reaching Kathmandu. So that way, we will get connected to Myanmar, Thailand, and this circuit will eventually get benefited. Uh, rather, we see it's like an infrastructural kind of uh, investment because China never says. It's an OECD member. It never says it's a Chinese aid or like a JICA or Quaker or or any other. It, it, they don't. China never claim themselves to be like a, a donor kind of status. They always say like a development partner or try to behave like a you know come up like an investor. So that way, the Chinese inter interventions having developed this infrastructural support, it is a win-win kind of scenario where Chinese investors are also coming. Because earlier, India used to be in this SARC region. SARC region, if I say India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, seven, eight countries. The India used to be the most dominant country in, in, in terms of bringing the investment. But now, the China has superseded them uh, because of this Belt and Road Initiative. And what we see as a uh, non-ASEAN members, uh, the China is playing, coming up. I don't say, as Gilberto has said, it's not like a countering the Japanese side, but they are exploring the new areas, you see. 
because uh, it's it's not like a China is no more interested in developing infrastructure in Thailand, but they are interest they are coming up because the most of the Thai infrastructures, if you see the Suwarna boom, it is supported by JBIC, I guess, right? JBIC, Japan Bank of International Cooperation, but chi China is coming the other than where. The Japan has supported. So it is they are complementing each other. The non ASEAN members are complementing. And this Belt and Road Initiative, they are making the tunnel under the Himalaya, under the Mount Everest. So it is, it is not easy talks. The bringing the railway, making the railway in, in, in this part of the world is a flat line, it's very easy. But the Belt and Road Initiative, they, have to, they are making the roads along the, across this Himalayan side. So it is very difficult construction work that they are doing over there. Uh, so this is this is uh, another I mean uh, 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 I mean Belt and Road Initiative. The China is coming up as a not as a foreign donor agencies, but as a what you can say development partner, where both mutual win-win or kind of a more uh, beneficiaries are also there. That's a good paper by uh, Dr. Mei Bo Huang. According to Dr. Sanya uh, from Kazakhstan. Uh, because this country, sometimes we get confused, you know, because uh, uh, Kazakhstan is a new country. It's, it's a really relatively the former Soviet uh, influenced country. A lot of heavy infrastructures were developed, but it is development is also what I do see is like uh, it, it's not uh, what they really want is not very much balanced, you know, the, the something like uh, uh, the, the, the development in Kazakhstan has grown up in one proportion, but what others are needed, other countries are, they need to be coordinated among the Central Asian regions. So that brings the completeness in the Kazakhstan. Still, the country is divided. I mean, countries like uh, become Kazakhstan, uh, there are some other Balkan countries, you know. So, so they really are coming up as a Central Asian countries, Central Asian <coughs> countries which complement each other. So that way, uh, the model proposed by Dr. Sanya to be like a, mm, ASEAN plus two should come up as a uh, EU plus two model. So this is this is again an another model that we are also working in, like a SARC plus two model or BIMSTEC plus two models. If we if we want to extend the BIMSTEC plus two model, Philippines and uh, Malaysia can also be very well connected through Thailand and Myanmar. So this this is this is a this is a concept that ASEAN has to think of in a, in her, uh, through her papers, like uh, what I see, ASEAN plus two countries. If we say BIMSTEC plus two country and ASEAN plus two country, so all this circuit will get connected. So this is this is a new concept that I do see, uh, not only because focusing on uh, seven ASEAN countries, that is Vietnam, the traditionally the, those ASEAN countries. If we try to have a plus concept, that that will bring up uh, new ideas. So that's about the Sanya's paper. Uh, and final paper, what I see, the lot of, no time no time. okay, <laughs> I need to, I need to stop. Uh, the new initi initiative from South Korea to ASEAN corporations by Dr. Lee. This is, I do see a new, new horizons in that paper, because the all the three presidents of Korea, I have been closely following these three presidents, Professor, Mr. Kim, no, Mr. Park, Mr. Roe, and Mr. Lee, right? They just try to follow the almost similar kind of concept what Japan was supporting this, I mean, the, I don't say supporting kind of a development relations in this part of the world. It was just, by name also it looks same, no? You say JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, Korea International Cooperation Agency, Koika, okay, Koika and JICA. There is a Japan Foundation, there is a Korea Foundation. So a lot of things has been, you know, these organizations are established. Almost we see the mindset in Korean leaders, like uh, uh, if they follow or they can win the Japan. That was a kind of follow and win kind of concept the Korean were doing. But the President Moon's new Southern ODA policy in response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, now, because it is not like a moon is not following that follow and win situations. It is something like a creating a new dimension, creating a new way of developing, new way of collaborating. So this is 
like even Kaidik is a one of the also that that way it is a, I have not seen like a Jaika is developing Kaidik kind of concept so this is a new wave the new kind of a philosophy is coming up if the Korea comes up with Korean model rather than following the Japanese model as uh, Dr. Lee has suggested w with, the, with, the, with the rise of the Mr. Moon's presidency like if Kaidik becomes stronger and it's a fourth symposium probably next year we are trying to propose this Kaidik to organize this event in Nepal where you will get connected with the Bimstick and Sark. So that, that way you know if uh, because ASEAN is a uh, still I must say you know this is if you go to Thailand you, I, I was in Thailand because I teach some of the Thai universities also uh, because one of my professor while I was studying Japan was from Chulalongkorn University so I am very much connected with Thai University so because it's a strongly you can see the presence of Japan in, in, in Thailand even in Philippines ADB International Rice Research Institute, strongly you will see the presence of Japan here. But if now the Korea is coming where you don't see much strong, if you go to India, a lot of Indian cars now is coming from Hyundai. A lot of Indians are now using Samsung mobile phone. So this is kind of complementing, bringing development in the areas where development has not reached. So Korea is Mr. Moon, I mean new president as you suggested, the new South Asian policy, new Southern ODA policy, in order to complement the Belt and Road Initiative that has been started by China and to, to complement some of the pockets where Japanese eff effects has not been there. So I think probably I do see the hope, the way Dr. Lee has presented, and if we could go on that line, so it will, it will make whole Asia or whole this continent to be more prosperous. I think I just try to see the, the concept other than what Gilbert has said. Probably you may, you may add on if something is missing. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shestra. Now may I request Dr. Jiyun Park to give Dr.'s observations. Okay, thank you, uh. Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jiyeon Park from Korea. Uh, you might be very familiar with my name on your email list since the beginning of this year. So firstly, thank you for all the participants to be here for this wonderful symposium. Thank you. Um, finally, we are all together. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have very brief comments on presented papers. Uh, first of all, regarding to Professor Lim's presentation, that was very interesting to me to look at gender issues with all female presenters in this session, right? Yeah. So I guess KIDEC and PIDS will uh, achieve significant marker from OECD DARF, right? Okay. Uh, simple questions. In terms of your conclusion from the paper, it uh, seems like a, a not very good result on gender equality issues from main donors' activities. And I would like to ask your opinion. Is that because of the measuring indicators or is that because of doing not good, uh, not enough activities? So I just would like to know about your opinion. And some more comments about your paper. Uh, actually, measuring by who, that's really important to measure real situations. So, uh, as you know, OECD CLS, that system is reporting system by donors. So, uh, they apply their intentions when they measure their indicator, their situation. So, we need to uh, confirm that what kind of measuring system they have in each country that might be really important to cover. Uh, in your paper and also measuring how that might be really important, really crucial. And actually we have almost no idea about that. And I guess every country has their own way. And I just worry about uh, how we handle that kind of point that bring out different kind of conclusion uh, in terms of your figures and your chart. So we better look at that in detail. So if you have any uh, detailed information, let us know and share the idea. And actually, we should know the similarity and differences about the idea on gender. That should be the first task for all of us 
to discuss about those kind of issues, measuring indicators and measuring uh, the ideas and those kind of things. So uh, again, therefore, our symposium might be really useful to share the idea about all kind of sustainable development goal, including gender issues. So let's have a uh, fruitful discussion. And second uh, and third, thank you very much for a very informative presentation from Professor Yukiko and Professor Mabel. And very quick question to Professor Yukiko. Uh, is there any mechanism for cooperation with Chinese aid for ASEAN development issues? I just wonder because you your presentation seems like a you have very similarity, like uh, especially the aid sectors, you have something in common with Chinese aid. So if there is some kind of uh, mechanisms you can share about your idea with Chinese aid, that might be really good for effective uh, aid giving to the ASEAN. So if you have any idea about that, let me know. And also quick questions to Professor Mabel that it uh, seems like a Belt and Road initiative cover all over the world. And I, I guess uh, your cooperation with the, all the recipients, that might be really important, but also how to cooperate with other donors, that should be also very important. But as far as I know, AIIB, that seems like a useful to cooperate, to handle all the issues between donor uh, perspectives. But if you have another like bilateral mechanisms, especially with Ch with Japan or with Korea or other competitive donors, that might be really useful. And if you have an idea about that, let me know. And I have a uh, little bit longer <laughs> comments to Dr. Lee because that's my field actually. Uh, I was studying about North Korean issues for more than 10 years so, and your approach seems like really attractive and interesting. If you, uh, actually at the beginning of your paper you say your research question is that you'd like to know about the determinant of South Korean policy making toward ASEAN and your conclusion that seems like a North Korean issue is the main determinant to make a policy toward ASEAN and that's really impressive and uh, I totally agree with that because issues on Korean Peninsula are always, always number one uh, priority issues for two Koreas or Japan and China or other, other main uh, countries uh, who are related to uh, uh, Korean Peninsula issues. So your conclusion makes sense and I would like to focus on that kind of points, not the other ODA, things like that. If you focus on the North Korean issues, that brings uh, more attractive paper. For example, like if you want to bring North Korean issues to South Korean's ASEAN policy, you better uh, compare, you need to compare the stories before and after the 1990s. So before, under the Cold War, there might be different kind of background, different kind of situation toward North Korea and also South Korea, also ASEAN. So you better compare the story about that. And I suggest that, again, you should compare relations between two Koreas. Like when they have very friendly relationship, there might be different kind of policy toward ASEAN. And also if they are under very hostile movement, should be different. Uh, and also, uh, you should consider about the relationship between ASEAN and DPRK. That might be really a uh, crucial determinant to discuss about the making foreign policy towards ASEAN. And one last quick question is that, do you think the policy toward ASEAN seems working effectively in terms of North Korean related issues? As uh, he mentioned that, it's this, this is very important security issues and I'm not sure about ASEAN is a kind of uh, main actors to handle issues on the Korean Peninsula or not. So I just wonder about your idea from your research, like a data analysis. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ji Yun Park. May I now ask Dr. Yun Sik Jang to provide the last perspective? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, I spent my whole 
uh, career uh, at the Koika. And based on my experience, I would like to make uh, some comments about uh, Professor Nishikawa and uh, Dr. Huang mainly, and uh, some comments about uh, Professor Lee for gender equality as well. Uh, I was a little surprised to see uh, Professor Lim's uh, presentation that uh, gender was minimal priority in uh, Japan and uh, Korea. But I don't know exactly about Japan. But as uh, my last career as vice president of Koika, I asked my staff to give more attention to gender issues as well, <coughs> on the condition that uh, without the gender empowerment, I think it is impossible to achieve social development, especially in ultimately in poverty reduction in developing countries. So as uh, uh, Professor Lim's uh, presentation uh, indicate that uh, COICA has uh, some kind of uh, uh, dual track approaches. And uh, we have already made uh, operational and uh, institutional arrangement uh, for gender uh, issues as well. And uh, maybe you know that the Korean government have uh, initiative so-called Better Life for Girls uh, by investing 200 million US dollars for five years to uh, the girls. Uh, it means that uh, after completion of these projects, I believe that uh, agenda, uh, uh, I think, uh, is uh, ODA volume will be increased. I believe that. So we will see. And my yeah, main yeah, comments regarding yeah, Japan and China, because I was involving uh, very deeply uh, with uh, JICA because when I joined the COICA in 1991, that year the COICA was founded, there's nothing uh, to be there. So we have a uh, scratching from the ground, from the starting, and then uh, at that time, JICA uh, did a very good job to share the, some kind of uh, experience as well. And also, I remember that uh, JICA accepted the uh, Koika staff for OJT training for almost uh, six months uh, every year, and then almost 10 steps be there. And then they went back to Koika. They play a very important role in making upgrading uh, Koika systems for that. So I really appreciate the JICA uh, in this sense. Uh, it means that uh, you know Japan's already already more than 50 years of experience and history. <coughs> uh, in other words, uh, Japan will play very important role in uh, leading agencies in sharing all the experience to other uh, countries as well. Therefore, uh, I think uh, uh, Japan <coughs> will do that kind of role uh, in the future as well. However, uh, I'm a little afraid that uh, Japan's new uh, OD chart in 2015 is talks about uh, a little bit the security-oriented OD programs. As uh, uh, Professor Nishikawa mentioned in her paper, that, uh, uh, well, what is the role of Japan leading agency to share the experience to other uh, country, it means that uh, uh, they are not just oriented to security things, but they are much more, you know, the agencies to share that kind of thing. That is uh, the role of Japan, I think. Therefore, even though I understand the Jap Japan's OD programs, especially in the security oriented, uh, counting to uh, China's appearance to, you know, uh, other developed, developed countries. but. Uh, I believe that uh, JICA or Japan will play a very important role in, especially in sharing South-South cooperation, tripartite cooperation, and also aid effectiveness. Especially uh, JICA uh, play a very important role in Korea's OD because in 2008, uh, in the Japan, 
and now integrated uh, grants and loan programs, so-called in new JICA, uh, to minimize egg fragmentations. It means that, uh, well, uh, Korea faced the same fragmentation issues as of today. So we right now are thinking whether we will follow new JICA model or not. It means that the JICA yeah, play uh, some roles in the future for you know, giving the role model for that. Uh, in this sense, I think uh, uh, Japan's yeah, as their orientation to uh, some kind of issues, especially in security, is a little bit uh, disappointing. But hopefully, uh, that will be uh, improved in the future. Uh, I would like to make uh, some comments regarding uh, Professor Huang's China. I had worked at uh, China for three years, uh, 15 years ago, as a, a chief representative of COIC offices in China. So I have uh, some kind of uh, uh, very intimacy and connection with the Chinese counterpart, especially Minister of Commerce, as well as Minister of Science and Technology, because they are our counterpart. And uh, this year, it's very amazing that China has uh, made new aid agencies, China International Development Cooperation Agency, <coughs> so-called. And uh, this is, I think, a starting point for China to have a, a very good systematic uh, approach of OD programs by, by making it. Uh, I think uh, China well, when I visited Africa and other developing countries, I feel that uh, some kind of thing which is not uh, coincide with the international standard. I mean, there are some criticism regarding uh, China's uh, OD policies, especially, you know, uh, loan level oriented tight ADs or something like that. But uh, if I uh, Chinese uh, position, maybe their criticism is a little severe because they are not a member of the OECD DAC. They are still developing countries. Therefore, I think it is a little bit understandable why the China uh, did uh, such uh, things uh, as of today. However, uh, China right now is uh, making uh, aid agencies and also uh, Professor Huang talks about very in detail in her presentation regarding uh, China's uh, new policies, strategies, vision, and also aid management, monitoring, and evaluation, etc., which is a main, uh, you know, the uh, management style of it. In this sense, I think. Uh, China will face many similar uh, problems like uh, Koika and Jaika in the in the past. Uh, therefore, uh, right now Koika invited uh, uh, new emerging donors like uh, uh, Turkish aid agencies and the Thailand aid agencies and the Kazakhstan aid agencies, uh, which right now starting OD programs. Uh, we right now share. Uh, that kind of the program with it. Therefore, uh, I suggested the China aid agencies to have uh, some kind of cooperation with uh, COICA or uh, JICA as well, because COICA and JICA has an uh, annual dialogue, once in uh, COICA and once in JICA, to have some kind of uh, detailed programs, how to make uh, uh, co-funding programs as well. Therefore, I suggested that China is also uh, be there and to have some problem like this. Because I think uh, development is not based on conflict or uh, it's kind of confusion or, uh, you know, it's competition. I think solely based on cooperation or coordination or complementality. Uh, therefore, uh, despite uh, some kind of historical differences or uh, some kind of uh, security region, whatever, uh, I think 
uh, development should be based on corporations as well. So uh, three agencies uh, will get uh, together uh, to move uh, for, the, for the development. This is, I think, the mandate of the development as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. yun -Sik. Um In the interest of time, can I just have one round of questions from the rest of you who may want to ask questions from our panel, and then I'll give the floor to our panelists, uh, the presenters, to respond to the discussions uh, given by our discussants. Any question? Yes, uh, Matthew. All right, well, let me begin by thanking the organizers. Um, that was a fascinating panel and, and great to have um, a, an all-female um, panel. Um, so my question is to, to um, Professor Huang uh, Mabel. Um, so I guess I, I preface this question um, by um, saying that I've um, researched Chinese aid in the past, um, but in a Pacific Island context, um, and several years ago now. But um, when I did that research, it was very clear that the aid initiatives were being um, led by um, Chinese contractors, the implementing parties, rather than by MOFCOM. Um, and so I, I looked, I was very interested to see um, the establishment um, of the new, um, new China International Development Co Cooperation Agency being announced. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, do you think that will lead to more of a top-down approach um, than has existed in the past? Um, and then a second question for you, if I may. Um, you mentioned trilateral cooperation um, in your talk, and this is always um, discussed with great interest in Australia, uh, in New Zealand. In fact, I think our foreign minister, almost every speech she gives on foreign aid, she talks about uh, trilateral cooperation with China. Um, do you think there's any real meaning to, to, to the term? Uh, it, they point, uh, the Foreign Minister often points to uh, an initiative in Cook Islands, one in Papua New Guinea, very small initiatives. Um, I don't see many results. Uh, is it just window dressing or, or is there actual meaning in, in the trilateral cooperation? Um, and I can see good reason <coughs> against tri trilateral cooperation, in fact, um, because obviously it would, um, you know, it, it involves great transaction costs, potentially. So, so it potentially um, has downsides, not just positives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from the? Yes, uh, Mr. Pham. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Pham from the DIV of Vietnam. Uh, I just have one short comment and two questions for panelists. Uh, the comment is that on the the work, the gender um, equality in Vietnam. I would just share uh, some information about this. Um, that uh, Vietnam um, pays uh, very much attention to the gen gender, gender equality. Uh, this is one of the, the main uh, objectives of the, the government of Vietnam. And since uh, 2011, we uh, have uh, implemented the national strategy on gender equality and we try to promote uh, the women's status in our national uh, agenda and development. And the women in Vietnam now, mm, there are ma many uh, women who hold key positions in the government, even the politi Politburo members and even uh, parliament chair chairwoman now is the uh, in Vietnam, deputy chairwoman of the parliament, the vice president and ministers, deputy ministers, a lot of um, high-ranking uh, officials in Vietnam, the government, uh, women. And 49% of women uh, is in the workforce of Vietnam now. It's nearly nearly uh, equal to the, the men. And 92% of child girls in, in Vietnam are now um, attend the schools. You see that we are developing country and we try to, besides we, we um, promote the uh, development of the country, we also promote the, the equality of the gender, genders in, in my country. So that women can particip participate more on the politics, economics, and social affairs of Vietnam. Uh, and I have two qu short questions for 
um, Professor Yu Kyo uh, and Professor Wang. Um, from Professor Yu Kyo, and you mentioned about the 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 competition between Japan and China on on uh, infrastructure uh, investment. So how could you Japan can compete with China in 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 this situation? <laughs> In new situation now, China has invest more uh, in the region, as uh, Professor Huang has mentioned previously. And for um, Professor Huang, you talk about NGO. You, you, you would like to to propose that uh, China would focus on developing the NGOs for to provide um, development assistance to other countries. But as far as I know, in China. But the NGO is not uh, similar to Cor South, South Korea, Republic of Korea, or Australia, or Japan. They have a lot of mm, NGOs, but China is different. So how? And the second question is that you mentioned about the theory of China uh, f to form foreign aid theory with China characteristics. So uh, I, I wonder. Uh, if you can explain more about the China characteristics, characteristics here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, and then short ones, okay? I've got a very uh, short question for uh, Dr. Lee Jinyoung. Uh, on, uh, I can imagine how time-consuming and labor-intensive <coughs> your data preparation is. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your effort. Uh, having said that, uh, I really wonder, uh, so sorry if, if my uh, question is, uh, uh, sounds blunt, uh, but why did you need a social network analysis for that conclusion? Uh, the you have a beautiful pictures, uh, but uh, the implication is uh, short and uh, yeah, what, what can you do further? What can you r read uh, from it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kim. And the last question would be Dr. Shilas here. Okay. Uh, I would like to have a short comment about uh, Mabel's uh, papers. Yes, very short. <laughs> Actually, uh, not all the countries uh, participated in the One Load, One Belt initiative. Not very happy about, but some of the countries are happy about, I don't know, but especially, I think it's, uh, if you have to, uh, like, uh, both win-win, will be a uh, benefit to the, the other countries as well. So, such as, how about the uh, wonderful lessons for China's industrial policy in the previous, like, um, local contents requirement ratio, such as, using some local peoples or local sourcings in their peoples. So that will be a uh, delegate in the m many of the uh, Southeast Asian country using their labor force, using their resources, that would be very happy about and using and utilize the China's infrastructure development. As well as how about its technology development sense Maybe uh, uh, Xi Jinping's leadership will be implemented in technology development cooperation with both of the uh, side of the developing country and China. So it will be beneficial to the Asian development sense as well as China will be benefited from this. So in that case, I think it will be both win-win to each side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last from doctors here. Yeah. It's already uh, past 12. So one or two of the discussions um, uh, emphasized um, um, about aid effect, um, aid conditionalities. I think it was Dr. Lianto who, who mentioned that. And the reality is that most aid um, come with conditionalities. And it's either tied to, uh, aid is either tied to the donor country's um, consultant services and commodities or to some policy conditionalities. Whether this is good or whether this is bad is a contentious issue. 
in the if it is a contentious issue, I think it's worth uh, to have more research, more objective, more rigorous analysis on its um, effects, on its impacts. And uh, on that note, I think we should um, um, have uh, more studies that will uh, determine um, whether whether development aid is aligned with the development goals and uh, plans of uh, the recipient countries and less with the goals and plans of the donor countries. And secondly, how much latitude is given to recipient countries in deciding where and how to spend aid money? Thank you very much. Now, I'll give each, panel, uh, each presenter four minutes and I've already have my timer here. So uh, do it quick, uh, do it well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I try. Um, so like I said, the Korea has, for the last six years, Korea has increased over 250, close to 250 percent of increase in the gender equality aid. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chang, because I think it, he, you, you, you played a key role for that. But my point is still, Korea, yeah, Korea has uh, improved a lot. We have a lot of improvement in terms of, of framework and policies and everything. However, still, Korea ranked second bottom in terms of uh, gender aid in terms of this proportionally. Japan, top two, but 99% of aid is going, to, going through the, under the uh, loan-based uh, secondary objective. Okay, the secondary objective is just perfectly fine as long as it's very gender sensitive. Women can get a benefit by uh, using the free road or safe road, but often this is not the case. We don't really know what happened there's no much that much studies on it. There's hardly any impact studies on it. So this is what I'm, I wanted to uh, the raise. And then I just give you one uh, example, like I already told you. For Japanese case, I found only one gender impact analysis about the port construction. What, it was a billion, close to billion dollar project, but it was marked as Japanese the gender equality aid. The reason being is Japan provide the condoms to the workers over there. There are a lot of uh, the construction workers. And so now my point is whether this type of measurement it can be a very valid way to measure the impact on the women's life. That's my point. And uh, so it, it's right, ex exactly it's a contention of, uh, contention of uh, issues that I, I wanted to uh, try. And in terms of uh, 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 the measuring the, the dock uh, train, or could they uh, also teach or guide the, uh, each dock, uh, the dock uh, donor country's uh, the staff to to mark, uh, the, the estimate this gender equality aid. So you can find their guidelines. Okay, so uh, do I have still one minute? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gender, so another question about the gender. Gender is not about women. Often their mis uh, uh, mistake is, we say, well, gender is about women. It's not a woman issue. So when I say, okay, gender inequality means there's a poor people, but unfortunately, 70%, 80% of poor people are women, happen to be women. So that's why we are targeting women, okay? So often the significant, this, uh, significant uh, marker is justified by DOC member, DOC uh, donors, saying that it is a very effective, quote, uh, the mechanism for the uh, mainstream, gender mainstream in aid allocation. I don't think so, okay? So that's what I'm saying, that try to make a point. I'm done with it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nishikawa, please. So um, now, whether Japan cooperate with China or compete with China remains to see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> remains to see. But in terms of infrastructural development <coughs> in Southeast Asia, uh, definitely both countries are uh, competing. Um, of course, the amount of assistance from China is large, and ev eventually Japan will be gradually reducing the amount. But Japan compete with China in terms of quality of uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure require long-term maintenance. Uh, for that, Japan is quite uh, um, confident to maintain and produce, provide good infrastructure. So it may compete with China, um, not in terms of amount, 
but uh, in terms of quality and long-term sustainable um, <coughs> infrastructure development in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ishikawa. Can I have the floor one, please? Mm. Uh, uh, because there are uh, several uh, questions for me, so maybe four minutes is uh, quite limited. So uh, I will try to make it uh, brief, briefly. Yeah, first is, uh, mm, uh, first I need to mention that uh, uh, the difference between One Build, uh, One Road initiative and the falling aid. One Build and uh, One Road <coughs> initiative is a kind of uh, uh, Chinese international development cooperation with uh, other country. Uh, in the new era, in the new stage. Uh, it's not a uh, falling aid strategy. It's not a falling aid, but the falling aid is uh, one part of them, maybe a small part of them, maybe 10% or 5% of that maybe related to the falling aid. But uh, generally, in, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, international economic cooperation. It's, uh, it, it should uh, uh, use the market principle. To, to evaluate, to cooperate with each other. So this is the first uh, I need to mention. And the second, uh, the second about the, um, the suggestion um, of the quick uh, JICA and the Chinese uh, new agency to the cooperation, I think maybe that is uh, uh, now is a little difficult because DAC member and non-DAC members. But I think uh, as a research people, uh, a research institute, we could cooperate, <laughs> yeah, closely before that, yeah. So I think because now uh, I'm uh, the director of the research institute for the international uh, uh, the International Development Cooperation uh, uh, Institute. So I try to, like, I think it, it's very good for uh, us, uh, Japanese, uh, East Asia countries, and uh, Korea. You uh, should until the we can uh, organize some uh, specific uh, workshop for for some topic more often. So I think that would be good for the future cooperation of the <laughs> the, the, the government <coughs> agency. So this uh, second. Question and the third one is about the mm, so how is the Chinese holding aid later the, under the new agency is top down or, or top top down or, or I think it's still like that because Chinese political system is like this so maybe in in the near future so it's still like the bilateral uh, cooperation with the other country and then the system is uh, top down but about the trilateral cooperation. And the ch I think uh, Chinese, uh, the government official in that uh, new agency, they uh, changed uh, their attitude to the triangular cooperation uh, recently. Because before, a uh, Chinese uh, attitude to this tri uh, trilateral uh, cooperation uh, is mostly, yeah, uh, from, from the government level, uh, is uh, uh, negative. They think, uh, why these uh, dark countries want to cooperate with us in helping the other developing country? What they want to do? Because they uh, it, uh, use more time uh, and uh, more resources to negotiate uh, to finish uh, one project. And we can't tell uh, in that uh, special uh, whose contribution is that? It's difficult to to different uh, to divide the the, con the contribution. So. Uh, 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 I stayed in, in Germany for half a year uh, to do some research in international development. And uh, in Germany, they have a government official document, especially for promoting this triangular cooperation uh, with uh, with these emerging countries. So, so uh, but uh, China before think uh, uh, they just uh, use the triangular cooperation with cooperate with the UN agencies, yeah, you and you, not uh, with the uh, dark countries. Uh, so the first uh, uh, Chinese cooperation in triangular cooperation is with uh, uh, New Zealand. Yeah, New Zealand. Yeah. So, but uh, now, uh, when we're discussing with them, it seems that they they are more open now, uh, more open to this now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, then, uh, then the question about the NGO, NGO's uh, uh, position in, in of course, uh, yeah, NGO in China domestically is also not very developed. So, so how uh, NGO can play uh, a more important role in in the development cooperation? Uh, uh, the even under the Ministry of Commerce, the the 
Department of Foreign Aid, they already uh, do some research on how to play the, uh, make the NGO play an important role and uh, learn from the other developed countries. Uh, and also there are some steps uh, in that already. So some uh, Chinese NGO, of course, uh, that NGO have the government background. So NGO, they already, they already, they are officially <laughs> NGO. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they already have some uh, like uh, Nipa. Yeah, Nipa. They already have uh, have their working place. They have several uh, uh, office, uh, uh, regional office in in Sudan, in Nepal, in. in already have some this kind of international cooperation already. But of course, uh, you can think uh, what, uh, ch yeah, they, are, they do something already, yeah. Uh, for, for, the uh, for the Chinese foreign aid with uh, Chinese characteristics, uh, this Chinese characteristics is, uh, I think that is uh, East Asia characteristics which pay more attention to the infrastructure, sector, those kind of things. Because China, everything said, uh, uh, Chinese economic reform, economic development with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> we always think we have a new system ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, of, of course, on the one hand, it is. But on the other hand, we mm. also learn a lot from the Western countries. And uh, for, the, for the international uh, cooperation uh, or uh, development cooperation, Mm, which can benefit the local the local people. Uh, uh, for the economic, uh, I think, uh, cooperation, economic, like uh, China built the railway uh, for the African countries, uh, they use a lot, uh, lot of uh, uh, local labor force and, uh, and try to train the local people because uh, like the Mombasa, Nairobi uh, railway, uh, China uh, even uh, established a school, a college, for training the local people, yeah, uh, uh, to to use to uh, manage to operate that uh, the new railway. So, uh, on the one hand, uh, this Belt and Road Initiative and Chinese Falling Aid is a kind of economic cooperation with the local people, and also uh, they try to use Chinese uh, labor force and the technology and uh, uh, equipment in the other country. But on the other hand, they need to abide by the local regulation. Yeah, on that. So. Uh, so, that yeah, would so be sufficient for now, Dr. Yeah. Wang. Uh, <laughs> we can continue the discussion after lunch. I think there can yeah, be yeah. opportunity okay. <laughs> for this. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the chair does not recognize great power status in this room. <laughs> May I have Dr. Sania? Yes, if you any. Thank you for uh, your recommendations uh, concerning the concept uh, in future. I will try to give <laughs> the concept of ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus two uh, on the example of the European Union plus three. Um, and uh, also, I will, I will add uh, that the main factor of low trade and economic cooperation between uh, Central Asia and uh, how you told about the region as a whole, uh, and ASEAN countries uh, is their geographical distance from each other, uh, the potential of economic growth of Central Asia and ASEAN is colossal, as, as all of us know. Uh, and Central Asia plays, uh, play, plays an important role in Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and I hope that in the framework of development of this project, uh, both regions have an essential opportunity for rapprochement with each other. Um, and uh, particularly this project uh, helps to cooperate between Central Asian states and ASEAN countries more deeply. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jin Young Lee. Yes. Thank you for all of the comments and the suggestions. And especially President Lee's point is important and critical point in my paper. At first, I tried to figure out which country and the issues more important to South Korea. But uh, I think it's not clear. <laughs> so, so I think of a revised poor, poor president's participation, participated regarding ASEAN meeting and merging and merging and tracking more specifically in the future. <laughs> and, and I'm I'm very grateful, uh, grateful thanks to a uh, grateful Professor Box, precious comments and uh, this paper is ongoing. So I will rethink about the key variable North, North Korea. And uh, I think, uh, um, for now, I think ASEAN is more helpful deals with North Korea issue to South Korea. My think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to my panel. Uh, of course, I think it's not fair for the chair to be able to summarize all of this, no? <laughs> 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 but let me just give uh, three, th three strands that I've been uh, hearing. First is this issue. Of we do have the ASEAN plus three here. I mean, the plus three countries are here. South Korea, Japan, and China. And if you notice, most of their development assistance in general is driven really by national interest and foreign policy considerations. Uh, as was noted by Dr. Lianto, this is not out of the goodness of their hearts. No? Mm -hmm. They have national interests at stake here. But the issue really is that a lot of these initiatives can be very fuzzy. No? When the Belt and Road came out, for example, everything and anything can be Belt and Road. And the new Southern policy is neither new nor Southern nor currently a policy. If you look at <laughs> it, no? there's nothing in between the new Southern except for peace, prosperity, and progress, of which anything and everything can fall again into the what kind that is. No? This was the discussion that we had also when I was in Seoul a couple of weeks ago. And then, of course, Japan is now reshaping its uh, development assistance. Uh, the most recent example was uh, moving from purely economic aid to providing Coast Guard vessels to the Philippines. So you can see that a lot of these developments are also creating impacts uh, in other areas. Um, the second strand is that we are seeing that targeted interventions, whether they're investments or development assistance, can create a difference in the lives of the countries in ASEAN, especially the developing countries. As we see in gender, the j data bears it out. More investment in gender equality creates positive opportunities for the countries. And finally, I think what's important to consider is that a lot of the issues that we have is primarily expressed in what is called in the liter literature as the Asian paradox. There's a lot of economic interdependence, but so much mistrust among Asian countries. Uh, and this kind of insecurity generally breeds competition and creates uh, problems, as we can see expressed in the various uh, tensions and flashpoints in Southeast Asia and the wider East Asian region. Uh, with that, please join me in thanking my wonderfully gender imbalanced panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've chaired the panel completely full. The four presenters are women, and I think that tells a lot about the agenda of our organizers. Thank you once again, <laughs> and uh, please uh, join me. We are going to have a photo opportunity with the president of the PIDS. Thank you.